What's up, everybody? It's your boy Marsman here, and welcome to Marsman Game. In this video, I officially discuss the report card first year of Halo Infinite. Which areas did it go right? How would we grade Halo Infinite so far? And can we see a resurgence in year two? I answer all these questions and more, so stick around to the end. This is Marsman Gaming. In order for me to fully break down these grades, I have to go into my alter ego, Professor Marsman. Well, three for three, let's take a look at these grades. Oh crap. To be honest, this is not really the year that we are expecting for Halo Infinite, but we do need to analyze the parts in which we're good, as well as figure out, is there any room for improvement? There are a lot of games released this year that launched broken, buggy, and did not live up to expectation. Unfortunately, Halo Infinite seemed to be one of those games upon its official release. According to 3 for 3, Halo Infinite is made for the long haul, so it's important as Halo fans for us to measure how its first year performed as well as see where they can go from here. This analysis will be breaking down Season 1, 2, and the Winter Update. When looking at the official transcript of Halo Infinite, it is broken down into the campaign and story editions, multiplayer experience, customization and store, the performance of the live service, and Forge along with custom games. Were these additions beneficial to the game overall and making it a good experience? Let's jump into it. When looking at Halo Infinite's story and expansions, it's kind of a mixed bag. At the start of Season 1, which is essentially the launch version of the game, it did not drop with co-op campaign, it was only a single player experience. Right off the bat, you're going to have every fan and content creator from Sean W, the Halo follower, destroy the game in every way. But to everyone's surprise, it was pretty damn good. It took a gamble with open world concepts and it honestly succeeded in what 343 was looking to do. Now obviously there were flaws in the story with the lack of environments, the subpar development of the banished, and missing pieces of the game that would have made it whole. But overall, most people would agree that 343 did a pretty solid job of setting up the future of Halo Infinite, especially with the low expectations that everyone had after 343 butchered Halo 5's story to a whole nother level. I mean, let's be honest, Halo 5 was just hot trash. They took risks and landed on basically most of the concepts they were looking to do and made it a very fun open world experience. However, as Season 2 Lone Wolves had released six months later, our expectation of the story would be that there would be some sort of story element that would be added to give us intrigue of what will be coming next. Never would I imagine that this Season 2 Lone Wolves update would drop little to no advancement to the story or the lore. The opening scene of this new season was pretty interesting because it showed off your character trying to save some Spartans that were on a mission out on the ring. We find out the Spartans that had survived were called Lone Wolves since they were behind enemy lines and needed to use resources around them to survive the mission. The characters we met are Spartans Sigrid, Illud, and Hinso Din. Each have their brief scenes with dialogue, but introduced with some interesting concepts. The basic story was that Din had secured a banished AI, which allowed them to use a technology of the ring, as well as have some secret data used for what the banished were trying to hide. But the first cutscene, I gotta admit, I was pretty interested to see how the UNSC was going to gain Eratu's ability to secure us all this data. Well, their answer was pretty dumb. They found a way to intertwine playing online multiplayer to working towards stopping Eratus and saving Din's life. Apparently the way to capture Eratus is to play on Banished Map Breaker and then you will get him mad enough where he will release himself from Din's brain where he can be put on a zip file. The cutscene of this season ends with Sigrid saying, well, good job, Spartan. You can always use another lone wolf on the team. That's extremely dumb. You could have come up with any sort of area of the campaign map you could just randomly be fighting Banish or even have a new map so it feels like you are actually doing something. In my opinion, it felt like the story drop had given so many fans hope that they were going to get a Destiny-ish story update. Instead, we were given barely anything. With co-op campaign being delayed until the winter update, this is the only thing we had for Season 2 when it came to story or any expansions of the allure up to this point. I expected better with having cutscenes, but with that being said, the concept they created with the Lone Wolves aesthetic was different and much needed. This wasn't a good story update at all, but this showed that it had potential if you do it the right way. The last update we had for the year was with the Halo Winter update. To be honest, after Season 2, I had low expectations for story expansion here. I do have to admit that when 343 showed us the preview for the Winter update, I was sort of shocked that we were finally getting online co-op. The biggest downside is that we were not going to get split screen co-op in this update, which was a major bummer for sure, but at least we had gotten network co-op to be included in this update. The Halo Infinite story was meant to be played with others and it elevates how fun it really was. What I liked about the update was that they actually made adjustments to the co-op network campaign, making the map feel more fluid 
and available for more players to be able to compete and have fun. Overall, Halo Infinite's story had some good and bad this year. The launch was solid with a lot of good reviews and reception. We didn't have much additions until recently, but it seems this category was carried by Season 1 and the Winter Update. When thinking about the overall grade, I'd probably give it a B-. It wasn't the worst aspect of the year, but it wasn't the best either. 343 did the very difficult task of getting me excited for the future of Halo's story after taking the crap filled baton from Halo 5. B- is a solid grade, but they definitely need to be more consistent in the future. Next on the report card is multiplayer. Halo Infinite did something that was unheard of. They released the multiplayer in a beta state before the official release of the game, which caught everybody by surprise. I was extremely hyped knowing I get to play the game early and I jumped right in. Season one was revolving around the theme of Halo Reach, which honestly got me in the feels because I always had a soft spot for that game. When it was finally released, Infinite launched with 10 maps, seven arena and three BTB. Pretty much all but launch site were solid. The gameplay is the best aspect of the game. Coming from the advanced movement aspects of Halo 5, I legit thought I was gonna have to start sniffing Cheeto dust and get myself ready for ultra slides and running on walls. But I jumped into the game and I was instantly happy knowing that we were getting a game close to Halo 3 with some updated movements, which is honestly exactly what I wanted. The negative that has played this game since the beginning was the constant battle over game modes. In season one, we had only a total of five game modes to play. No major drops and the worst part my favorite game mode, Big Team Battle, was unplayable for around three months. It was a very tough situation. We had a fantastic gameplay, but not enough ways to play. For six months, Halo fans had struggled to stay attached to this game, but with the rival Season 2, there was some hope that this would change. Season 2 Lone Wolves at least made some strides in creating new experiences. Dropping two new maps, one Big Team Battle map known as Breaker, and the second Catalyst. Catalyst is probably still the best map in the game, so that was a positive. Reefer 3 did a better job of providing game modes to play like Attrition, Land Grab, Last Spartan Standing, and others. When looking at multiplayer additions, it definitely received a bump in content overall and gave us more ways to play than the first six months of the game. Around October, I gotta say, the perspective of how we felt about Halo Infinite was pretty bleak. After nearly a year into the game, we have only received a handful of modes and only three maps total. And if you ask Halo content creators about this winter update, they would consider it to be Judgment Day for the entire game. I didn't think this was going to be the end all be all for Halo Infinite, but I really wanted to see something be dropped. When they showed us what to expect from this update in one of their live streams, I was shocked to see what was arriving. We had actually received an organized calendar of modes that would be dropped for the next few months. Updates to modes like BTB, Arena, and the inclusion of new maps did get me excited to test them out. I had made an entire video discussing how the winter update was going to be a turning point in the game because it kind of emphasized the dropping of content, which I always felt was the biggest issue that this game has. Overall, the multiplayer experience is going to be a mixed bag depending on who you ask. The first six months of the game were pretty rough due to the lack of content and the missing modes and maps that really could have helped the experience of the game. But as we went forward into season two and the winter update, we did get new ways to play, which did help the experience overall. But even if the experience right now is good, we do need to recognize of where we started and where we are now. And for that reason, I'm going to give the multiplayer a B. I think the multiplayer experience is carried by the overall gameplay of Halo Infinite. The mechanics are good, but the fault always relied in the modes and maps. Sure, there are still a lot of things that need to be fixed, but that's why we give this a B. Because overall, it's been a solid experience, but for God's sakes, you have a gem here. You gotta be better. Where we all will notice a major dip in the GPA of Halo Infinite for the first year, is going to be the customization and the store. One of the biggest flaws with Halo Infinite is the ability to be creative with your Spartan. 3 for 3, since day one, has decided to take away one of the basic forms of customization that has been around since the beginning, which was the ability to pick which colors you wanted your armor to be. Instead, we inherited this color palette system, which essentially is close to Destiny in its format, where we can't even pick the colors we want, but they give us colors as combinations instead. This idiocy also continues into the design of our emblems as well. I remember all too well that Halo 5 tried to pull off the same crap when it was first released. For some reason, 3 for 3 has this fascination with limiting player creativity when it was such a pivotal part of what makes this game fun. How is it possible I can't just make my own emblem? The same thing is said about the game's armor core system. At first, the system was very interesting because you can customize different bases of your Spartan, but quickly we realized that this limits your ability to select armor pieces since only certain pieces can go along with certain cores. My anger reaches plus ultra when I have to look at the store and how it limits us and by basically putting armor pieces behind a paywall. This limits my favorite aspect of Halo and only furthers my anger when I look back at some of the comments made early on in its development where devs claim that this game would mirror Halo Reach in its customization. Right. What's crazy that most of those devs that were in the first preview video that lied to our face 
have either been fired or left the company. So they've been eliminated from the Squid Games, and honestly, good riddance. Season 2 and the Winter Update have at least done a better job at fixing the problems of the past. Season 2 saw the adjustment of the store to at least not demand $20 for the basic color blue, which is better than before. But with that being said, there are still a lot of bundles out there that are pretty damn expensive, and in a lot of cases are more expensive than the battle pass entirely. In both updates, we've also seen 343 start the process of creating cross-core customization with armor pieces like visors and color palettes. But this is so late, there isn't much positive to go with at the moment. Overall, I'll give this grade a D. For majority of the year, customizations had limited fans to only be able to use specific armors, colors, and cores which essentially limits you on your creativity. I think this is one of the biggest aspects of Halo Infinite that is lacking due to the fact that if you compare Halo customization from this title to the previous games, this pales in nearly every facet. However, with the recent updates, you can see that they are at least trying to make things more accessible to the player, but damn, you gotta hurry up the process here. Now we arrive at the live service, which is probably the grossest and most hated aspect of Halo Infinite. This feature of Halo Infinite is probably the most despised and the sole reason for the spike of unemployment in the past year. Ever since Halo Infinite was announced to be a live service game, most fans, including myself, were uneasy about what this meant for the franchise and skeptical whether it would actually work. Well, let's check in and see how it went. It was a complete failure. From the moment Jerry Hook sat there awkwardly in the live stream saying that the reason why we left a box product was for the benefit of the gamers, I just knew that this was going to be a train wreck. Season 1 proved that any system that had an inkling of live service was at its core broken. BTB was unplayable for 3 months and 3 for 3 had such a struggle dropping a simple update to fix it. It felt like 3 for 3 had a total of 3 people working as developers on the game. How is it possible that it's this slow to fix the basic problem and glitches that are constantly bugging this game? Season 1 can be categorized best by quoting Microsoft executive Matt Booty. 3 for 3 has stumbled at the finish line. Season 2 suffered from the similar things that Season 1 had problems with, but I do gotta say the fracture events were a much needed improvement. But honestly, this does not save the great. The winter update shows that 3 for 3 has been getting better at dropping content updates in a quicker fashion, but just think about for a minute. It took 11 months for 3 for 3 to finally add content without having to wait 3 months to address issues. Some people might say, well, Mars, you're being too critical of the game. Let's just say your cell phone company is preventing you from making phone calls or text messages. You contact them to tell them that none of these features are working and they respond to you, we'll get it done in three months. Most likely you'll say that's a crappy service that's unstable. With that being said, I'm going to give the live service a straight up F. This is just straight up bad and they haven't done enough recently to save the grade from being a straight up failure. This is a really bad mark for 3 for 3 and they definitely need to make a lot of improvements to make this even a passing raid in the future. Finally, we reach Forge and the custom games. Fans, including myself, are ecstatic that we get to play all these new modes and maps at any time we want. However, we have to remember where we were at launch to get to this point. For those of you watching that are fans of custom games, you remember all too well that this game was launched with a broken system that was unable to play at all. I remember that it would crash daily and the game lost a lot of its fan base they really just wanted to sit back and play social games with their friends and community. I can say the same thing about Forge. I had mentioned nearly six months ago that Forge is crucial to the success of the Halo franchise. Since Halo 3, Forge gave kids the ability to make maps and modes that they wanted to show off to their friends and the public. Halo 5 is a perfect example of how Forge literally elevates an experience. With that being said, we did not get Forge in Halo Infinite until early November, so it was nearly a year after its launch. That's just straight up unacceptable. Forge and the custom game browser, based on stats collected for player retention, has shown to have saved the player base of Halo Infinite. I had mentioned in a previous video that if Forge launched with no major hitch, that it would lead to a re-emergence of the game, and it seems like that is finally coming to fruition. For anyone that has tried Forge, they only have good things to say about it, and the options are endless with what you're able to make in that mode. Overall, due to the population boost and the recent greatness of the winter update, I'd give 3 for 3 a C in this category. I was ready to give 3 for 3 a failing grade for the year, but Forge in the custom game browser is so damn good that it literally saved the entire category from bombing. The Halo community is absolutely loving Forge in the custom games browser, 
but it's like li too little too late. This is a great addition later on in the year, but you have to be more consistent throughout the entirety of its launch. So when looking at the GPA of Halo Infinite so far this year, there's definitely some strengths that we had to talk about, as well as some major issues that need to be addressed. Its first year, the campaign and multiplayer experience has some great components but it definitely needs more to feel like an A. Origin Custom Game Browser has greatly impacted the game in a positive way, but to wait until nearly a year for us to finally get access to this is pretty disappointing. The live service and customizations needs a lot of work. By adding all these scores together, I'd probably land around a C plus for the year. It has some solid aspects, but there's definitely a lot of improvement that could be done to really boost this grade up. So with the official grades out, it's important for us to see how can we improve Halo Infinite to be an A in year two? The biggest thing I noticed is that even with the new leadership at 343, three, content has been coming out faster and what's this? Content arriving early? In year two, 343 three needs to prove to all their fans that the long wait is finally going to be rewarded. Content needs to be released either on time or early. This would only show much needed consistency that this company has been lacking since they've taken over Halo. I'd love to see some expansions to the story, but that won't arrive for some time but at least work on co-op or even Spartan Ops. Multiplayer modes and playlists definitely need to be made, like things like Forge Favorites or Action Sack, so that fans can get their hands on new creations and get to play that as much as possible. Forging custom games will be adjusted in time, but we really need adjustments so that it doesn't crash or you can include your fire team in your search. Customizations need to be reworked, and for the love of God, can I please pick my own colors? The biggest thing I'm looking into year two is consistency. Release content for us to play in a timely manner, and I gotta say, I can guarantee you that fans will come back in droves. I think right now, Halo Infinite is a, in a way better spot compared to what we got with the launch state of this game. I'm hoping that in Halo Infinite Year 2, that we can consider it to be a golden age of the game. And hopefully when I come back next year and make my analysis, I can make that claim a reality. Right now, the outlook of the game is looking more positive than negative. But I can guarantee you that if 3 for 3 fails in Year 2, we'll have a completely different outlook and it might be straight up ugly but prove us wrong three for three let's see if you can bounce these grades back and i'll definitely give you the a if you deserve it thank you everyone for watching what grade would you give halo infinite in its first year drop what you think in the comments below and if you haven't done so yet please hit that thumbs up and subscribe for more future content go check out our twitch where we live stream multiple different games with the crew and the community come join up with the crew by clicking on the link below join us on social media on twitter and discord and that is also located in the description below. Until next time, this is Marsman from Marsman Gaming, signing off. Peace out, guys. <laughs>